Um, it, it is really a great pleasure to, to be back in uh, Egypt. Um, I've been to Egypt many times. Uh, Egypt is uh, one of uh, my loved countries. Uh, I feel like at home in Egypt. Uh, I like uh, Tamiya, we call it falafel. <laughs> and it's the best <laughs> in, in Egypt, in Cairo, all around. Um, but uh, really, this is the first time I, I come to the, the intelligent, smart village. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed by uh, the development uh, for innovation, for technology, and uh, the energy that we, we find here. And uh, I, I hope to, to discover more about it in the future, to come back and uh, see more today. It uh, was very, very uh, fast and short uh, trip. I, I can do it. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it, it should work now. Yeah, <laughs> although it is a little bit too wide, and uh, and we have problem. Yeah. So um, today I'm I'm going to share with you something that uh, has been uh, developing this year. Uh, we're 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 still in uh, 2016. And uh, Ocean One, uh, for the first time uh, in history, uh, we managed to take a humanoid robot uh, all the way to the depth of uh, the Mediterranean and uh, recovered some treasure. And uh, it was uh, quite amazing. Uh, not uh, just that we were able to go to the field, but, but really to conceive a robot of that complexity uh, and uh, take it all the way. Uh, a real mission in the field. So one of uh, uh, the, the other aspect of this is that this robot is the result of many years of research and development in robotics that took us from uh, humanoid robotics. Humanoid robotics uh, uh, is a, a very important uh, and challenging problem uh, involving mechanisms, machines with many degrees of freedom, a lot of motors, a lot of uh, actuators, a lot of uh, software to plan the motion and uh, the interaction. Uh, so at Stanford, I uh, hosted uh, ASIMO, you see ASIMO here, for over uh, 10 years. And uh, so ASIMO came to Stanford to study and then graduated and went back to Japan with a lot of new skills. Um, it is uh, also important to realize robots are, uh, well, going to help us maybe, but robots can be very dangerous. And uh, uh, especially because robots were built first to, uh, to be used alone in manufacturing, in industrial robotics. So we are today facing the idea that we are bringing robots closer to human, and that means we need to think about the safety. So safety is one major challenge in robotics, and safety is uh, one of the things we are addressing in our research in human-friendly robotics. Another, another important aspect of robotics is also the fact that we need to interact with the robot. Uh, whatever we say, don't believe it. Robots will not be autonomous alone doing things uh, in, the, in the next 10 years or, or more. Uh, we need really to think about the human and the robot together. A human and robot uh, interaction. A human and robot interaction means we need an interface and haptics is one wonderful interface to create where we not only see but we can touch, we can feel, we can physically interact with the robot. Well, haptics is not only about uh, being able uh, to interact with physical robots, but also about interacting with the models of those uh, physical robots or models of the environment. Think about a machine. You're going to build a new machine. You have a great idea. You put the different component. You can do it in the computer. But once you build the machine, you want to uh, 
check whether all the parts are movable or assemblable, et cetera, et cetera. How can you do it? Well, you go to the simulation and the haptics, and now you can extract the different parts and see your ser service stability. You can analyze the system. In fact, all our robots are designed in simulation first. We, we develop uh, a sort of XML file description of the robot. We upload it to the simulator. The simulator creates all the software needed for that specific robot. And then we can simulate, control the robot, test it, and then we can move on. Robots also require um, planning. Planning uh, is very expensive computationally. So computational, uh, the computational complexity of motion planning is exponential in the number of degrees of freedom. So if you have a, a humanoid robot like ASIMO, you will have about um, 30 degrees of freedom. Exponential, it is huge. So you will spend days planning. So one idea in, in motion planning uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Ala mentioned earlier is the idea of uh, uh, interactivity with the environment using potential field. So uh, later on, I developed a concept that will take the potential field to the plan. So a plan can be modified in real time by applying potential field everywhere. And this is called the elastic planning. Very interesting. We, we always think robotics is about robots. Not really. Robotics is about all articulated body systems, elephant. Uh, animals, uh, we can model them using robot techniques. And if we can do that, we can also model human. In fact, human were our uh, like model in terms of uh, the motion, the behavior of human, and what we wanted to do what was to understand how human move. We are amazing. Human uh, life Every aspect of life is amazing when we are really looking at the machines. We see how far we are from, from the ways that a human can perform things. And at the same time, technology and science brings models that capture behavior. So we were able to capture the behavior of those machines or articulated body systems, so we apply them to human. And now we can analyze the human motion. And, and biomechanic people were amazed. Wow, these algorithms work in real time. You can simulate a human motion. You can create all these motions in real time. So we started applying this to, hum to, to human, and we started applying other techniques uh, involving uh, looking at uh, how human represent tasks. How human represent tasks is very important for robots to uh, capture concept from human and move them to robots. So human motion is inspiration for humanoid motion. Uh, human skills are just amazing. I mean, we discover skills that uh, we don't know how they come through experience, through, through uh, training, but finally we capture them. How can we take these skills and map them to a robot? Well, first we need to understand the skills. We need to model these skills and represent those skills and then somehow uh, produce similar skills by the robot because the robots are different. Well, this is what I'm going to show you a little bit. We are going to explore different domains. I'm going to talk about Ocean One. I'm going to talk about how we can go to the field with robots that are not just designed to move inside indoor environments, but really going to the field and moving in challenging environment. How can we help human understand the human brain? Using those technologies, uh, we are using uh, haptics to stimulate the brain to perform complex tasks while we are looking at the brain from MRI. By combining the data, we are discovering a lot of amazing characteristics about human representations and models that we capture and build uh, as we interact with the world. 
obviously all the other aspects related to task uh, automation, uh, performance and assembly uh, problems uh, are part of those areas of applications. La Lune. So who speaks French? La Lune. Okay. <laughs> La Lune means the moon. And the moon is this vessel of Louis XIV uh, that was built in the 17th century and that sunk on 1664 in the Mediterranean. So this is a story of a, a very important vessel that they were looking for for a long time. They discovered in 1993. So it took a long time to find. They found it not far from the coast of France near uh, Toulon, uh, which is to the east of Marseille. Anyway, how can we go there? Well, the challenge is it is very deep. It's 91 meters beneath the ground. And let me show you a little clip of uh, a movie that was made about this boat uh, from Arte. And in this movie, we are just illustrating uh, the concept that if you, you want to take a human to that depth, it is, it is almost impossible unless you protect the human inside a suit. So they built those suits, and this is a suit from the Navy, uh, French Navy, that is going to be used now with a human inside, pressurized suits, and the human is lowered all the way down. And now you are able to be there, but to move, you cannot move because it's very heavy and stiff. So you have thrusters and you are moved from the boat. And then when you reach something, you can try to, to grasp it and open it and uh, interact with the environment. So it's very, very challenging. Why? Because human can dive to some level because we can take some pressure. And the pressure that we can take is going to be uh, limited, uh, well, by, by the time we spend there. And, and uh, ultimately, we need machines. We need machines not only to go to bring treasures from archaeological sites. We need machines to to go to the environment. Uh, in the Red Sea, uh, next here is amazing, the amount of uh, coral reefs that you have. Uh, all that environment that we are not really monitoring uh, properly uh, would require a lot of divers, a lot of work. Well, uh, maybe we need to place sensors, uh, collect samples from time to time. We, we need to think about all the structures we are building. So pipelines, uh, oil structures, offshore platforms. In fact, if you think about all these tasks, it's unbelievable all the different uh, tasks that involve interaction underwater. So when this is very deep, it becomes crazy. So let me show you just uh, last night I edited this clip and it is in French unfortunately. So this is the story of going 130 meters. You see the sound? He, he didn't get uh, the proper air. He had oxygen with helium. Because the air that we have, if we put it to too high pressure, we will, we will really uh, create poison. So they, they have a mix of oxygen and uh, uh, helium that is used here to condition the divers. So the divers come to this boat and they sit inside a capsule and they, they stay seven days in the capsule to be conditioned little by little to the pressure of 130 meters. And then when they are ready, they, they cannot move now. If they move out, they will die. The only way they can move out is to stay another week to recondition back to the atmosphere. 
So I'm showing you this just to illustrate how challenging, how crazy it is today, how dangerous for a human it is to, to take the human to the depth. So they are now going to go down with this machine and then they go out. Now they are conditioned at 130 meters. And when they are able to move out, they, they are going to do work. So this is where they are uh, staying for that week uh, of training. And uh, they have to bring the food, they have to... I'm going to move it a little further. So now they are working underwater. They are working and, and creating... Uh, the, so why they are there? Because there are bolts that uh, are eroded by the time, so every so on they have to go and change the bolts, and this is a very, very challenging task. So what do we have to replace the human there? Not much. I mean, we have a lot of fantastic robots. They can go and see. They can look, find the Titanic, but they cannot touch the Titanic. They cannot do things underwater. And if we really want to do something very difficult, we have really to do it, have some robots. The Schilling robots, they, they built uh, five and six degree of freedom arms that are teleoperated hydraulically. They are very difficult to use. So I thought it is time for us to think about a machine that can take the human skills to the water and that was the concept of Ocean One. So Ocean One is this robot that has bimanual manipulation capabilities and this was the concept. The concept is to create a machine that can dive but let the human on the surface to touch it. So when the robot is diving, reaching the bottom of the ocean, you're sitting comfortably on the boat and you can feel what the robot is doing. So it's sort of like your hands now are in the water, projected there. And here you can see, this is uh, uh, my student uh, operating the, the robot uh, interaction on the haptic uh, side. So basically you are using a device, and this device is the same device we use for mm -hmm. medical robotics, for surgery. And when, when, we, when we are interacting through this device, we are able to see, but at the same time we are able to touch and we are able to affect. So we are going to be able to do all of these things if we can create that connection. Well, this connection requires communication. So if we use uh, sound, uh, it's not going to work. It's too slow. So we are using an optical modem. And the optical modem is going to be uh, connected to a relay station. And the relay station provides that connection to the boat. The reason is... Uh, optical communication is going to uh, dissipate within 15, 20 meters. So that's why we need the relay. But the relay is very important also for the power so that robots can recharge. So putting a robot together like this is really challenging, especially if you are doing it in a laboratory and uh, in the university. So here my student uh, assembling, putting all the components. You, you can see the different parts uh, that we, we put together. Uh, we, we, we get uh, uh, also a lot of uh, support and help from uh, a small company in uh, the Bay Area called uh, Mecca Robotics. That uh, uh, This company actually got bought by Google. And uh, here, here the uh, initial design of the head and different uh, component that goes into uh, the robot. Here is the simulation. As I said, everything we did was developed through simulating the robot, interacting with the robot, seeing how we can uh, 
in, in fact interact with the physical world, these simulations are uh, physical simulation. So when you are touching something, you can feel it in your hand. When you make contact with the environment, the simulation reproduces the contact forces and all that information. This is a whole system that we built in-house at Stanford uh, and developed. Finally, we built Ocean One. So Ocean One uh, came after three and a half years of development. Uh, last, uh, this image I think is from uh, last uh, March, uh, maybe end of March, and this is uh, uh, an, uh, an image of the Ocean One in the pool at Stanford, and uh, we did a lot of testing there at Stanford in the pool. But every time you have to go to the pool, you have to pull the robot, you have to take the robot and then uh, bring the robot down inside the pool, and then every time you discover how much the pool is difficult because this robot cannot not, not uh, uh, operate in the air. It is too heavy. So in the air it's 250 kilograms, in the water is only 50 grams. I mean z zero gram. And there is no, no weight, uh, so the robot is balancing and moving in the water in uh, very easy, easy way. So, you, you have to do all these tests uh, and then you discover every time there is some more, more aspect that you forget about. But then there is one day when the robot is ready and then in that day uh, we decided to send the robot to the Mediterranean. I will come back to this a little later, but first let me stop here to think about what we are talking about. We are talking about environment that are dangerous, difficult to reach. And for those environments, we are building a robot that can allow us to reach. So we reach we, beyond where human can reach. So if we are able to do that, well, there are a lot of other environments. We have the mining. So why don't we think about uh, robots that can provide support for mining? We, we can we can certainly not replace the worker with a robot, just autonomous robot. But we can, uh, 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 for if you, if we are really clear about it, if we substitute the physical human there with a robot, then if we connect that worker with that robot through a haptic interaction. And if that robot is able to use the same tools that you then we are going to be able to do it. So this is the same thing for a geologist. These geologists go in areas that they just open to inspect and test and use tools. We can substitute with the robot, but the geologist can be connected again through a haptic device. What about high altitude stations? where a human cannot uh, be. Well, this is another uh, problem that requires uh, machines to physically remove the human from dangerous spaces where the human cannot go underwater, underground, in space, or in high altitude mountainous places. So robotics made huge progress in the past uh, 50, 60 years. In fact, uh, robotics uh, progress was mostly in mobility. We have robots that can fly, we have robots that can uh, swim, we have robots that can uh, uh, move on the ground, and these robots are mostly autonomous in their ability to navigate, and uh, we have smart cars, we have all kinds of development in mobility. But what about doing useful things, like interacting physically with the world? You need, you need robots that can go beyond mobility to touch, feel, and make uh, things. So here is Asimo. Asimo is uh, an amazing machine. It is here dis demonstrating its navigation, uh, locomotion, jumping capability, stability, all of that. 
But in order to make ASIMO useful, like in here, where ASIMO is interacting with the world to open a bottle and serve some uh, green tea, well, it takes a lot of work. And this is the challenge. I mean, when, when Honda demonstrate and showed this, yes, the robot can do it. But what we have to think about is how much programming went into this. Because when they are demonstrating this, they spend a lot of time before pre-programming the robot to move every joint, every aspect of the motion, all together to produce that motion. Well, now, how come human can do it without, without any trouble? A little child is able to open the bottle. I can try. Uh, and 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 it's it's so difficult for robots so what is the reason well the reason is we are used to controlling robot that are in manufacturing in the assembly line and in there we think well this robot is going to do over and over the same thing so let's spend the time precisely programming the robot ahead of time. And now it's going to do this over and over. But in those environment, there is no way you can pre-program the robot. There is no way. The only way you can program the robot is to be smart, to have skills, and to interact with the environment using those skills, but in real time. the ways to teach the robot and communicate with the robot is what I uh, explained earlier about and this is the haptic. So in here you can see how your hand is operating a haptic device. Now this haptic device is connected to the robot. You can show the robot where to move. You can uh, show the robot uh, what forces you want to apply. You can also record how human do it and try to understand how human do things. Haptic interaction is an amazing technique, but haptics allows us to also uh, rescue the robot from uh, peril when the robot is in trouble. To do that study, as I said, we need simulation, and in those simulations, it's not only animation. It's not only physical dynamic integration of uh, those equations. It is also contact. When, when you have contact, it's very hard. But when you have multiple contacts, it's harder. But when it comes to be multiple contact between multiple links, it's really, really difficult. We developed algorithms to solve those problems in real time. And then we can go and now control the robot. Uh, here is Gerald, uh, my student, uh, running uh, the haptic device through the haptic device, interacting with the robot and controlling the robot in the simulated world. So the only way, the only way we can get our robots to work in those uh, challenging environment is to elevate the capability of the robot. We do not want to program uh, this robot at machine level, machine uh, code. We need to go up and up in abstractions to a level where we can tell the robot, open the, uh, this bottle, place the bottle, uh, take the computer. So at much higher level with the skills. So we need to bring those skills to the robot. How can we bring manipulation skills? Humans are really good at manipulation skills. So. The key to skills, if you think about it with human, is compliance. Machines, when we were building machines in manufacturing, we were relying on precision, accuracy, speed. Now, what we need is to create compliance, the ability of the robot to move without actually knowing where it's moving, but to move 
to a contact, understand the contact, and then react, move as a function of the contact. So in here, what we are demonstrating is the ability of the robot to do face-to-face -face relationship without knowing the, the program, without knowing the trajectories. It's using the contact information to rotate. And that is coming from uh, the concept that we use with robots to build their skills. So what are these concepts? We build primitives that rely on compliant frames. So this is a compliant frame. When we are in contact, we have a reaction force. If we take this reaction force and a moment about this frame, it will go make this, this is a moment, it will make a rotation in this direction, in the proper direction to go face to face. If we locate that frame and describe the characteristics of the controller, we will be able to create a frame. So what we do is we say, all right, let's observe the human and see how a human do it. Now, the human is running experiments, and those experiments are going to be recorded. We are recording the position, the velocity, all of these characteristics, from which we extract the frame and the strategy the human is using, and then adapt it to another strategy for the robot. We have to be careful. Humans are different from machines, and machines have uh, different advantages in terms of the feedback, but humans have amazing characteristics in terms of their prediction. So we implement it differently, and now the robot is going to be able to perform this task and generalize to different environment, different material, and even to dealing with large errors. So for instance, if I go and modify the grasping uh, of this object, the robot doesn't care, continues to perform the task. The task is not even, I'm disturbing the robot, I'm pushing on the robot, the robot continues to do it. So the architecture of the control is relying on sensing the environment and interacting with the environment and feeling that environment. So here uh, is a, a piece of uh, wing. Uh, it is a 787, uh, Boeing 787 wing, and we are placing this piece on the wing. So to do this, it's very complex task because it's a whole program. You have to go feel your way and detect the, the contact and location, etc., etc. You see, at every instant, the robot will do it. We're going to disturb the robot, and robot is searching its way. I'm going to disturb the robot and take the robot. That was the end of the video. So every time the robot does it, we can disturb it, and the robot is going to search again. We didn't change the program. It's the same program. But it is a robust program that is allowing the robot to perform this. The program involves test, check, uh, uh, contact, uh, whether uh, you, you reach a final condition. All of this is like a, 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 a whole complex uh, uh, predicate-based program that describes all the transitions and the actions, and the robot is able to do it directly by observing the human. Now, we are still doing a lot of that uh, by hand, by looking at the robot. We are looking also at the human motion itself. So the human motion is uh, going to uh, help the robot to better come up with uh, strategies. I wish I have more time to tell you just about all what we are doing around human analysis, uh, finding all the, the secret about, about uh, how we become a, a great athletes because we, we get a better understanding of performance and strategies. We can measure the uh, performance of a human uh, how they, when they make use of their uh, physiomechanical advantage. We are able to 
reconstruct their motion and create that motion in real time so that we can in fact inform human about how to move. Human can wear sleeves and get feedback, visual feedback and tactile feedback to make corrections so you can you can build uh, those uh, uh, motions and performance uh, much better. We are building models, uh, in fact, that are uh, uh, subject specific. One thing about human modeling is the fact that every human is different. So if you are uh, an athlete, uh, you, you have your motion, but if you go and try to imitate the athlete, it doesn't work. You need to fit the motion to your own physiology. So we develop physiology that is associated with uh, every human, and this is done by scanning in MRI human and rebuilding the model uh, of the human. And now when you go to analyzing how human uh, uh, do those motions, uh, if you are a golfer or if you are at tennis, uh, uh, we can uh, in fact help improving uh, your performance. Uh, anyone needs help with, uh, with improving tennis playing or I don't know. I can help you. I know the secret. Do you want to know? <laughs> so, so actually, actually it, it, given, given the limitation of your muscle forces, if we think about every muscle has some capacity, if we take all these capacities and project them as resulting acceleration at the, the hand, we have some resulting acceleration. It is inside some bounds. But if we use a racket, uh, then the, the acceleration change, the kinematic change, everything change. And there is an atlas description of you and your capacities. If you move along that atlas of motions, then you will be the most performant during those motions. So how we do it, we, 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 we close the loop, we observe you, like you're standing in the front of the camera, and as you move, you feel corrections, and you, 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 you perform that. This is not only good for athletes, it's good for recovering from injury, uh, assisting people, training in many, many different uh, situations. And this is uh, maybe another idea for a company. <laughs> All right, I, I mentioned something about the brain. Let me just uh, tell you briefly. Uh, so the brain is amazing. I mean, we don't understand, we understand so little about the brain. But, but if you really want to look at the brain, you, you, you need to see uh, a brain activity. And to see your brain activity, usually we use fMRI. So inside fMRI, it's confined. You cannot do anything. If you want to understand motor control, you will need uh, a way to stimulate the brain to perform those complex tasks. And what we do is we use haptics. Because with haptics, when you see, you, you see inside there is a screen, and you are looking at the screen, you are performing virtually those tasks, your brain is activated and your brain is, is performing uh, the same task and now we can connect a task to uh, the brain activity. Okay, here is Ashimo now uh, growing up, becoming really, uh, capable of moving compliantly, following the guidance of the human and, uh, and also the robot is uh, understanding human intention. So here we tell the robot, don't touch my hands. And the robot will move the hands away. And this is because the robot is seeing and at the same time understanding the concept of not touching by measuring distance and staying away. And, and this, is, this is reactive. This is real time. It's not based on planning. It is sensing and reacting in real time using uh, c capabilities from uh, 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 artificial potential field implemented within the whole body control framework. So I'm going to take you now through some uh, uh, concepts that uh, take those ideas into applications in different areas. So for instance, everyone heard about the catastrophe in, in Japan, uh, Fukushima. So Japan has a lot of robots. How come we couldn't replace human with robots? It would be wonderful to have a humanoid robot going there instead of human exposing human to dangerous uh, environment. And in fact, uh, the, reason, the reason is that 
Yes, we built the mechanism, but we didn't really build all the control and software that allow the robot to become capable of interacting with the environment at multiple contacts. Humans all the time are interacting in many parts of their environment, and those robots were designed to move just on flat indoor environment. So the concept of making contact and using the contact is very important. Human use this all the time. If I'm moving over rocky terrain, I use my hand, I use my body to support and not to fall because biped walking can not be stable for, for robots in, in those challenging environments. Now, if you touch an environment, you're going to slip. So these cones, uh, yellow cones, represent the area where the reaction forces can be. If the reaction force go outside, you're going to slip. But the environment is moving, and we are demonstrating how a robot can balance in this very challenging, dynamic environment while avoiding slipping and uh, maintaining uh, uh, the uh, motion uh, and the contact with the environment. All right, now we're ready to climb. Have you seen any robot rock climbing? No? Yes? Good. So I, I, at Stanford, we, we, we built not a, 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 a robot that is climbing by suction cups. Probably this is the one you, you, you saw. Uh, uh, the, the suction cups are uh, very useful, but it will not let you uh, really use all the legs and uh, possible arms that the robot has. So we built this capability by extending the capabilities of multi-contact. Multi-contact, the robot is moving, it generates new forces, the reaction forces are changing. So what you need to do when you have multiple contact is like if you are holding an object, if you exert to contact, you can break the object. So there are internal forces. You need to control the internal forces. And here is uh, what we are doing uh, with those robots. Uh, this is HRP4C uh, from Japan. And the robot now is climbing, balancing, and walking up uh, by transferring the weight from three contact to another three contact. It is quite amazing. Amazing in that we are able to keep the balance of the robot while it is moving dynamically in that environment and avoiding the slippage, checking the environment, and doing all of that. Now, this is the beginning because now we are using our hand to make contact. What about using tools? What about uh, ski poles? So, human use tools all the time. And with tools, we can go from biped to triped, quadruped, what I call supraped. And with supraped, you can create now uh, this pole that has sensors, visuals. And then you have tactile sensing, you can feel the contact. And then the robot is going to move, it's going to feel its way is going to make contact with the environment and is going to uh, uh, make the next step. This is how you can change the problem. The problem that we, we had was thinking, okay, I have to balance on two legs. And balancing on two legs is okay if you think about it in terms of flat environment. But when it comes to those environment, you have to change the way you're thinking. You have to think about, well, human discovery. And once we have these trajectories, we need to adapt them. So we have a, we designed a trajectory, but the real environment, so between the moment you plan and the moment you are ex executing, you have many different uh, steps. And typically it requires uh, rope planning. Rope planning is very expensive. So what we do is in real time, we readjust a plan. And by readjusting the plan, we are able to execute the same plan to keep that plan valid all that time. And this is done within seconds. 
So if you wanted to replan, it will take hours, sometimes a whole day to find a full plan. Okay, let's go back to Ocean 1. So Ocean 1, Ocean 1 was not just uh, a robot, let's take a vehicle, put arms on it, and, and uh, cameras, and, and dive. This was really uh, a way to create an embodiment of the diver. It's very important, and we will see it as we, we, we move uh, further. Uh, this is because uh, if we think about a vehicle with uh, arms, think about space ducking. You have a space station and you have a, a vehicle coming to the space station. If it's going to do the ducking, there is no way of stopping it if it's coming too fast. <coughs> so in here is the same problem. The thrusters will not stop this robot from smashing everything and breaking the environment. The only way we can do it is look at the arms. They are going to bend. This arm bending is very, very important to creating that dynamic response of the robot. So the arms are bending to take out the slow inertia of the body because the body of the robot is the macro system, heavy system. The arms are electrical motors with much smaller, uh, uh, much faster dynamics. And now we use the arms to take out the inertia and the robot stabilizes. So we designed the workspace of the robot to, uh, to, uh, to, to maximize the range of motion of the uh, workspace where the robot can use those properties. We also looked at the dynamics of the robot, not in terms of the dynamics at the joints. Who cares about the dynamics at the joints? What we care about is really the characteristics of the robot when it's interacting with the world. So these ellipsoids represent the mass properties of the robot at the hand. That is, this is the amount, the mass that will be touching the environment. And if it is large, this will create a big problem for the robot. You see this big bubble, this is representing the sum of all the different masses when they are connected together. So if I have one kilogram here, one kilogram here, effective mass in this direction, and I'm lifting a one kilogram, the result is going to be three kilograms. It's additive, but you have to be careful because in, in some other directions, it is much heavier. So it could be 100 kilograms. When the robot extends the arms like this, it becomes almost infinity if the robot is attached to the ground. If it's attached to a boat, it will be the weight of the boat. So we have to be very careful about how we position the robot, what uh, workspace we are going to use, and that allows us to do the manipulation proper, properly, accounting for the dynamics of the robot. The other problem with robotics is that very often we don't realize that different parts of the problem require different uh, uh, spectrum uh, characteristics, different frequencies, and we are dealing with a system that requires real time for the mechanism, slower time for the inputs, uh, much more time for the cognitive capabilities and perception. So what we have is we have a system interacting with the world. On, in here we have the line of perception, and here the line of actions, and we have these loops. These loops are going to interact, first of all, with the machine. We need to deal with the robot motion. We need to deal with the robot own constraints, self-collision, uh, joint limits, uh, obstacle avoidance with the environment, all the constraints of the robot. And then we need to deal with the contact, that is the environment, that become a constraint for the robot. And all of this should do be done at kilohertz, very fast. So this first loop is going to use very fast feedback and communicate with the robot to control the robot at a kilohertz rate, real-time control. The input of this is going to be those skills, those primitives. 
and this can be slower. So we can go to 100 hertz, 10 hertz, uh, 1 hertz. As we move up and up, the processing of the perception becomes more abstract. Now we are looking at features. We are looking at building models of the environment. We, it's going to take much longer time as we move up and up. And the actions are much more abstract as well. They are plans for actions that are very complex that will be translated in terms of uh, uh, primitives and skills that are sent to the robot. Now, this architecture is going to allow the human to intervene at any level. So the robot has a lot of skills, but the human can come to the rescue when needed to sense, to feel, to correct uh, the, what the robot is, is doing. Haptically and uh, through the interface, the human is going to be interacting with the robot. Very often, what happens is that, well, this haptic interaction uh, is one mode, but the robot most of the time is going to be in autonomous mode. And using this interface, we are able to communicate and program the robot at, uh, to reach autonomously uh, different locations and to operate in the environment. So, I'm showing you this in contrast to many techniques in robotics where we come to a problem and say, all right, I have to control the robot. So we look at the whole problem as one loop. That is, we try to do the planning, the control, and all the interaction with feedback in one, one level. We think about it as it is my problem to deal with the whole thing. And that result into uh, a lot of challenges to the framework. The framework that make use of this decomposition that relies on the nature of the problem in terms of the physical requirement and in terms of the uh, uh, input and in terms of the encapsulation of skills in terms of primitives allow us to build an architecture, a hierarchical arch architecture that increase the autonomy of the robot, and at the same time, reconnect the human uh, to the robot. So here is the robot in the water, and the robot is now uh, controlled haptically. Uh, it is uh, really interesting because when the robot would come to the pool, the students will come and with their cameras and start taking photos. You can see the students sitting uh, on the and uh, they, they, they just uh, watch the robot and sometimes they swim with the robot. And finally, uh, this robot was ready, was ready to, to go to the mission. And um, I, I said one afternoon when the robot uh, was in, in the pool, and you realize how difficult it is to take the robot to the pool. So I was telling my student, tomorrow the robot will not, get back, will not be back to the pool. The robot will be going to, uh, to the Mediterranean. So the robot took a lost photo at Stanford. This is the main quad. We put it in a box and we send it up all the way to the Mediterranean. Uh, the Andre Malraux is a scientific boat for archaeology that uh, is uh, the boat our collaborator uh, provided us with. Uh, to, to do this mission, we lowered the robot to the sea. First, we, we, we thought we take the robot and place the robot uh, at a level where divers can go and we can check everything. So we uh, moved the robot to 15 meter and there the robot was interacting with divers, uh, interacting with uh, uh, the environment, uh, performing different uh, tasks, and, and we were amazed. I mean, so you take your robot from the pool to the sea. The sea water is different from the pool already. The buoyancy is different. You need to do a lot of adjustment. And, and immediately the robot, actually the robot was happier in the sea. <laughs> For some reason, the arms were floating better. Everything was... And, I mean, we are happier uh, at the sea as well, but, but he was really, I mean, the robot, he or she, I don't know, uh, w w 
I mean, r really uh, happy there. And, and uh, through the, the interaction, you can see the robot was, was floating in a in, uh, very comfortable way, and everything was working. So this is the view from the eyes of the robot, of the diver interacting with the robot. So you see the view is coming uh, to the screen on the boat where we are sitting with the haptic devices to control the robot. And then we were confident enough to say, all right, let's, uh, let's take the robot uh, all the way down, dive to the 91 meter and uh, see what is going to happen. So it was, it was really scary because 90 meter, 100 meter depth is, is, is really something we never experienced with the robot. I mean, we know we built our robot to dive for 1,000 meter. I mean, the cylinders, everything is really, really deep. But the, the floats, the, these uh, uh, orange things you see there, these are only uh, qualified for 200 meter. After that, they will start breaking and then the robot will sink. So what we had to do was to make sure that every step there was no leak of oil uh, that would bring water inside the electronics and everything. There was no, uh, because it's, the arms are oil filled. And, and uh, I mean, so many, many sensors, so many uh, things could go wrong. The robot didn't mind, we dived, and our colleague wanted us to go between these two um, cannon. These cannons are amazing view of the uh, La Lune, the boat, and the robot was navigating, everything was going well, and suddenly the robot gets stuck under the cannon. And between the two cannon, the robot was completely like locked. And for a few minutes, we were looking at the situation and it was, it was night. The captain was uh, saying, Osama, you have to, we have to leave. The, the water is getting really dangerous. We have to leave. I said, no way, I'm not leaving my robot. No one can go and rescue the robot. It's really deep. I mean, you have to bring maybe the Navy's uh, robots uh, with the, with this, with the uh, suit to go down to, to, to reach the, the robot. It was completely stuck. And this is when like, you have something you never experienced. You don't know what's, what to do. Everyone was panicking. We were sitting there. I took control of the haptic device. I looked at my arm that was stuck there and at the robot stuck completely, couldn't move. And then I said, okay, I'm going to use contact. I will push against the ground and by pushing against the ground, I will free the robot. And the robot jumped. And we will see it on the video. You will see different views from the top, from the side when the robot, I, 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 I just put a clip that's showing you like the, the time uh, was very long, so it's very short clip, but it shows where the robot was stuck and how the robot was rescued. But there is something about this fact that with this interaction, you can feel an embodiment. The robot is taking you physically inside the environment and you are working naturally interacting with the robot naturally in ways that we couldn't do with with other robots you can see how happy i was it was it was really really amazing that that we and then uh, basically we 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 went to another area and the truth is this was done that night uh, we decided to go back it was too late so we came uh, uh, we wanted to go the the day after the weather was bad the day uh, after there was a, a break uh, uh, of power in on the boat and finally it was the last day was friday what day we are today tuesday, tuesday. so friday is still far away. that was that was it was unbelievable like that friday i said to myself what should we i mean we have really to finish it and we came all that way the boat was busy it was going to leave on, on Saturday, I said, okay, 
we will start at 6 a.m. By noon, we will have the treasure. We have to go and do it. And uh, we, in fact, by, by uh, 11.30, we have er done everything and returned from uh, that mission. That was quite amazing, and you will see the excitement. So what you do is you collect uh, treasures. You place them inside the container. You see on the container there is uh, a floater. When, when uh, uh, you're ready, you press a button, and the, the whole thing will go up and then it will be collected from uh, the surface. And uh, we, we brought a treasure uh, for archaeology. Uh, it is a, a Catalan vase from uh, 1664, unbroken, untouched. The archaeologists were amazed. How come we, we I mean, because the tools they are using to get there, they, they have robots with jaws. When they touch anything, they break it, they destroy it. And uh, here is the Catalan vase that is now uh, in France uh, 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 with, uh, with the archaeologists, very happy and proud that we, we managed to create a new era of uh, exploration for archaeology. But, but uh, this mission is really an illustration of the where robotics can uh, take human uh, without exposing human uh, to danger. So here is the video telling part of that story. And uh, so uh, after sending the box, here is the box again from the other side. Now the robot is in Marseille, and from Marseille we, we take uh, uh, Ocean One with uh, uh, André Malraux. And uh, now uh, we are about to lower the robot to the sea. Uh, there is a, a lot of uh, steps to do that with deployment of uh, divers in the water because the robot can hit the boat given the fact that you have a lot of waves. And uh, once uh, the robot in the water, the divers will go and uh, uh, help the robot uh, to be freed from all the cables and connectors and uh, then the robot is free to move down. So the robot was tethered, we didn't use the uh, uh, optical uh, uh, communication because uh, we needed anyway the power uh, to last more than one hour. The battery will last only for one hour. So here, divers are interacting with the robot, uh, playing with the uh, different objects and interacting. So the haptic device on the top is moving like this and the robot is doing the same. So now the robot is ready and uh, Olivia is telling the robot, bye, go ahead, I'm not coming with you. <laughs> because now the robot is going to 91 meters. So Every step the robot was taking, every meter, we were so worried that things will go wrong and uh, some leak will happen. But uh, fortunately, the robot was uh, able to do it without any problem. And uh, now the robot, so it's dark. We put already lights down there uh, so that we can see where we're going. Uh, this is the haptic device and, and the room is, the control room is full of screens. So we're looking, monitoring many different things. And you can see uh, now the, the bottom, we can see the uh, some uh, cannon over there. And uh, very shortly you will see the robot coming from the top. And uh, the robot is now coming down. 
and uh, maneuvering around the robot, uh, around this cannon. And when the robot comes close to the surface, you are, all the sand is coming up because uh, the. Uh, you can see how. And now the robot is caught. You see, uh, the fish are moving, but the robot is stuck. So this is uh, the maneuver. Uh, I'm, I'm pushing now. Uh, I already pushed the, the robot up, so it is freed. And now the robot is is uh, moving with the thrusters uh, to free itself from the other side. It was amazing. I mean, we lost the robot, and just the fact that you 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 connect physically to the robot, you you and the robot. So now we. This is on the second uh, third day when the robot is back on on the second, uh, uh, and we didn't know anything about what we were going to find. So we we identified this vase and. Uh, uh, we maneuvered the robot around the vase to, to grasp it. Yes. And now the, gra the, the, the vase is in the hand and the other hand is holding the robot from behind. You can see it in the screen. This is, uh, the problem is we, we have multiple screens. Uh, we, we, we now, I'm going to place the robot inside the container. So you can see the right hand placing the, the and now the last thing to do is to close the container. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> that 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 was that that was that was uh, sort of like after three and a half years of work, after so many hours on the boat, a whole week. And yes, we did it. Because once inside, then the whole thing comes up automatically. And then uh, the, the, the feeling was, was just uh, unbelievable. And, and without this team, I mean, we, we really uh, worked with a team that was amazing, the, the group of archaeologists. Uh, Michel Lour is the director of archaeology. And he was pushing for this to a point that everyone was so excited. And finally, we, 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 we came back because we went as two teams, different teams, but we came back to be really uh, one team uh, uh, looking for the next mission. And uh, we already started looking at uh, many other opportunities. But, but r right after uh, this, there was a Congress uh, for um, Archaeology in Marseille and uh, uh, at the Museum de la Mer uh, of Marseille, uh, there was the press conference where we presented to the world uh, 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 this robot and what happened because we kept it uh, wrapped until we were sure that we had it uh, worked out and everything was, was uh, fine. So the, there were many, many people, 20,000 people who wanted to see the robot. So the director of the museum asked us if uh, we could leave the robot in France. Uh, we were returning the day after to, to California. Mm -hmm. So I left the robot in France uh, for uh, about three, four weeks. And then the robot came back to Stanford uh, in uh, middle of June uh, to a big reception with the uh, French consul of San Francisco and a big party because everyone was so excited about uh, this amazing results. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.